everybody, I'm Roxy and this is Work Me Best. So today I bring you my non-fiction November wrap-up. I did upload an October November wrap-up, which is actually just like October with a November thrown in the title because I couldn't upload the October video in time. If you want to check that out, it's in the eye as always. So let's get on with it. Nonfiction November is a month-long reading event hosted by Gemma from Nonfic Books and uh, Olive from A Book Olive. Both booktubers I really admire and like a lot, so I'm going to leave the links to their channels down below. The challenge is just to read nonfiction, read a little bit more nonfiction than you usually do. So it's if it's your first time reading nonfiction, then just like read one nonfiction book. And if that was your case, or you would like to explore a bit more really readable nonfiction, I did a first time nonfiction November uh, reading suggestion uh, video you can check out in the eye as always. So there were four challenges that one could choose to partake in or not, I did. And so the first word was home, and for this I finally chose my bookstore. Writers celebrate their favorite places to browse, read and shop. Now this wasn't in my original TBR, which again you can check out here, because I hadn't acquired it by then. Oh my god, it's gorgeous. It's an anthology of American writers describing and talking about their favorite indie bookstores across the country. Not all the essays were brilliant, of course. There were some that I didn't appreciate very much. I took the time to read every single um, essay in here. However, I still gave the book itself five stars because I think the idea behind this book is so solid, the execution is beautiful, and it's not about promoting the bookstores as much as it is about understanding what a sacred space a bookstore can be. And it's interesting because, yes, sometimes they mention stock and like the variety of books you can find, but the key to any great bookstore you'll find is its staff, and that's why I, I chose it at home because it's the people and their involvement in their community that makes bookstores, especially independent bookstores, a second home, a safe haven for readers and writers. Then for the challenge of love, I picked up Insomniac City, New York, Oliver and Me by Bill Hayes. Bill Hayes, who's a writer whose partner dies when they were living in San Francisco, I think, and he's heartbroken and he sort of needs to start living again, start fresh, and so he goes to New York. And there in New York he meets Oliver Sacks, the neuroscientist, and they fall in love and stay together until Oliver passes away uh, in 2012, I think. This is much more of a couple memoir than an urban memoir. I thought it was going to be much more about New York, and it is, a little bit, but not really. It's much more about the relationship between these two people and how that fits into the city. It's told in a very interesting fashion. It has chapters of content, but it also has like pictures of people, like literally random people, and also it has um, like little vignettes and conversation uh, between Oliver and Bill. And it's just heartwarming book. A lot of people didn't like it because it's very disjointed. Um, it's more about vignettes and just that raw emotion, being gentle, being happy and loving and I think we need more of that. I gave this 4 out of 5. I thought it was really really good and I think a lot of people would enjoy this. So if it sounds like something you would enjoy, I urge you to pick this up because I think it's like a warm hug. Then another memoir but completely different tone, instrumental by James Rhode. So James Rhode is a pianist um, who started playing when he was younger but he only became a professional pianist when he was like 30 something going on 40 and this is due to his tragic life story. 
he was molested for five years as a child and that sort of determined his whole existence. He suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder and he's still getting over that and this was written in 2012, I think, I'm not sure though. Um, they are told in a very stark and honest fashion without him playing the victim card. And if anyone could play the victim card, it's of course James Rhodes, but he doesn't. He sort of reflects it with not a detachment, but with just like hindsight. And you can tell sometimes when his anger becomes too much, when his sadness becomes too much. And it's just like getting to know him in a very intimate way. It's a very intimate memoir. And also at the beginning of each chapter, there is a suggestion for a track, um, a piano track, of course, that you can listen to while listening to, while reading the chapter, and also a brief story of that track. His love for classical music comes really through, and you learn a ton, which is, it's sort of a terrible thing to say that you learn a lot about classical music while reading about events that are so messed up. But the fact is that he frames everything around his recovery, around classical music and its healing power. So in the end, it's not about the suffering as much as it is about the recovery. And I think that that's the value in this book. I gave it 5 out of 5. I think it's literally the best memoir I have ever read. I will say though that it's quite triggering. If you have struggled with depression, um, self-harm, suicidal thoughts, it can turn out to be a very triggering book, I'm not going to lie, and he does mention that. But if you think you can handle it and if you think you are up to setting on a journey of overcoming those feelings, I think this book is great. For the fourth challenge, um, scholarship, I read What Are You Looking At? 150 Years in Modern Art by Will Gompertz. So this is the Spanish edition, but um, one of the editions in English is like the same. And this is just what it says. Journey through the begin through the history of modern art from its very beginnings and compressing a little bit of contemporary art as well, which I think it was really cool. Will Gompertz writes in a way that's clear and interesting, engaging, and you learn a lot. Especially if you don't know much, like I did, or maybe you know a lot about modern art and you don't know like the chronology behind it, I think it's really useful. What I will say though, that if you know nothing about art, yeah, this might um, turn out to be a little bit like WTF, because you do need to know, I mean, I have the faintest idea of what composition is and symbolism and you know, have some references from the Renaissance, for example, but just the slightest, because I'm not uh, an art buff by any means, and I did understand everything, so I think it is very readable and it is very, like, user-friendly. It also has pictures, not as much as it should, though. It has some color pictures, and then uh, throughout the book there are, and now I can find any, nice, there are some uh, yeah, there yeah, we go. Some uh, pictures in black and white peppered through it, but definitely not all of these. And considering that this is like 150 pages, it could be a 500 page book and maybe contain all the pictures mentioned because, yeah, I mean, you can imagine them and they are described, but let's be real, we are going to Google them and then so have to stop reading and then Google them. I think it's Sort of defeats the purpose and so I would like for the book to include all the pictures but anyways it has a very um, dynamic narrative voice and it also sort of creates some dialogues maybe between Van Gogh and Gauguin or like Picasso and Matisse you know that sort of thing um, it creates certain scenarios that for some people that's not allowed in nonfiction, but I think they added a lot to the narrative and the presentation of the book. So I would say they were great. I gave this a four out of five, really enjoyed it and really recommend it. Then I read three more books. One of them was a reread, The Pleasures of Japanese Literature, which I got 
from the library because the hardback version is so freaking expensive. My only hope to ever acquiring it is to just steal it or find it used. Uh, I've talked about this a lot. It's a collection of five lectures that Donald Keene did at the Public Library of New York. They are brilliant, they are really introductory, but really capture the essence of Japanese traditional literature. That if you like Murakami or Kawakami or even Soseki, I mean, you will find traces of traditional all over them. So I would urge to, you to pick this up. It was part of my recommendations in the video that I left here. And anyways, it's really readable, it's really user-friendly. Then I have Birds Art Life Death by Kiyo McClear. This I talked about in a way that wasn't true at all. Like what I said before, not true because I hadn't read it and now I've read it and it was a very different book from what I expected. This is a memoir of Kiyo, who's a writer, um, while she's sort of depressed, uh, having a midlife crisis, let's say, because her father is ill and he, she's taking care of him, but she has, he has, had been estranged from the family for, for uh, quite a long time, especially during her childhood. And she's also, although she loves her husband, she's sort of felt that something is missing in her life and so she tries to fill this void with something. She's looking for a guide and he founds, and she finds this musician who's into bird watching and she becomes fascinated by birds and starts bird watching with him. It says here a field guide to the small and it's significant. It has also quite beautiful pictures, it has drawings as well, um, it has its moments but it didn't blow me away, you know what I mean? I'm trying to find the pictures, this is why I'm not looking at you guys. It has, like, drawings. She draws quite well, I might add. It's more, more than a memoir, it's sort of a compendium of thoughts. It was just fine. It didn't blow me away. I thought this was going to be a five-star book as well, and it certainly wasn't. I, I'm doing that challenge, that tag, so if you want to check that out, you can find it here. So I gave it, I think, a 3 out of 5. It was a good book, but yeah. Then another one that I read that wasn't on my TBR, and this is the final book I want to talk to you about, is The Secret Library by Oliver Tierley, and this is excellent. It is a compendium of interesting anecdotes regarding books. The last anecdotes are quite recent, considering, and it's just a compendium of data regarding books, like specific books, and it's so interesting. You learn so much and I want to reread this next year because I have forgotten half of it, but some of it has stayed so much with me, I still think about it, and yeah, I've added several books to my TBR because of this, and it's just a fascinating book. That's all I read in uh, Nonfiction November. I hope you liked this video. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up, please subscribe, and comment what you think of these books. Have you read any? Are you planning on reading any? And if uh, you want to check out this channel in Spanish, as always, it's down below. Also, um, there's my social media, I have an Instagram account, I have Twitter, etc, etc. By the way, I'm also doing a 20 in 20 challenge, which is, yeah, my TBR is here, and I'm going to upload reviews of five books for that challenge. Anyways, I hope you like this video, and see you next time. I had a great reading month, and I'm having a great reading month today, because October was good, I read lots of interesting things and I thought November might be disappointing just because comparison, but no, November was amazing. Just look at the ratings, nothing lower than a three and mostly fours, two five-star reads, you're kidding me. So yeah, 